Can Down syndromes unlock the cure or unlock the mystery of Alzheimer's? I'm Deborah Kahn, founder of Being Patient. Today we're gonna to talk about the relationship between Down syndrome and Alzheimer's and try to understand um, how this relationship could possibly shed more light on dementia. Joining us is Dr. Brian Scott Coe. He's um, a medical geneticist at um, MassGen. Thanks so much for joining us. Deborah, thank you so much for having me. So I have to admit, this is not the first time that I have heard um, Down syndrome and Alzheimer's being used in the same sentence. So what is the relationship there? Well, you know, I liked your opening. We truly believe that I think people with Down syndrome are going to have those keys to unlock some of the mysteries for Alzheimer's for the rest of us. And as a medical geneticist, it all goes down to the genes on the chromosomes. So just as a reminder, the typical person has 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs of chromosomes. People with Down syndrome have an extra chromosome. So they have 47 chromosomes. And that's because rather than having the typical two copies of chromosome 21, they have three copies of chromosome 21. So when we zero in on what are those genes on chromosome 21, we know that there is a gene called the APP gene. And that is a gene that encodes for plaques and amyloid plaques that could build up in the brain. So whereas a typically developing person has two copies of those genes, someone with Down syndrome has three copies. So this is in part believed to be some of the contributions of why people with Down syndrome accumulate plaques sooner and more often than their neurotypical counterparts. So a lot of research is being invested into what can we do to help improve the medical outcomes for people with Down syndrome, but how can we also partner with them so that they can help us understand more about Alzheimer's disease? Okay, now you mentioned APP, which um, I've heard of in reference to an early onset marker. I mean, there's, so is, is that the same APP we're talking about? So there is the APOE marker, which is distinct from the APP gene. But in this case, I'm talking about the APP gene, which we all have. And we all have two copies, but people with Down syndrome have three copies. By having an extra dosage, it means that they're starting to accumulate those beta amyloid plaques at an earlier age. Okay, so yes, people with Down syndrome do develop Alzheimer's earlier. So I thought though that there's three early onset markers. It's like presenilin one and two, and then you have APP. Yes, yes, that's true. Are we talking, is that the same thing we're talking about? Yes, yes, we okay. are talking about that, yes. So we know that if, if, if someone has one copy of um, APP, then they're gonna 100% get early onset. Am I right about that? Is that the same for, for um, people with Down syndrome? Yes, so everyone has at least two copies of the APP gene. It's a matter of whether or not those genes might be mutated or changed. So for those with early onset dementia or Alzheimer's in the neurotypical population, it could be because one of those APP genes is changed in such a way to cause early onset Alzheimer's. But everyone at least has two copies. It's a matter of how it's programmed. People with Down syndrome are programmed with an extra one. So they have an extra dosage or extra programming that comes from the APP gene. Okay, and do we know why people with Down syndrome always have this, um, this this gene so we know that down syndrome is from the fact that they have a whole extra copy of chromosome 21 and that chromosome 21 like all of our chromosome 21s has a set defined list of genes on it and so it's simply an extra dosage of that gene and that gene is active just like all the other 500 genes on chromosome 21. We know that people with Down syndrome rarely get breast cancer. People with Down syndrome rarely develop solid tumors. So there are probably other genes on that chromosome 21 that are protective against certain cancers. There are other genes that might cause some of the learning disabilities. But when it comes to Alzheimer's, uh, there's a lot of focus and research on that gene simply because people with Down syndrome have that extra dosage. Okay, and, and, and taking it really away from the genetics, but the presentation of neurodegeneration, how does it, um, I mean, obviously with Down syndrome, you are born with that and you live with that, you know, from, from a very young age and, and, and it doesn't change. I mean, you, you grow up with Down syndrome. Um, you know, Alzheimer's is more neurodegeneration that comes at a later time. So what 
types of associations can we make in terms of the neurodegeneration versus the on, you know, just living with Down syndrome? So we don't have any bona fide cases of people with Down syndrome developing dementia before the age of 35. But starting at the age of 40, about 40% of people with Down syndrome do develop dementia related to Alzheimer's. And around the age of 50, more than 50% of people with Down syndrome do develop dementia. Now, one curious fact is the other 50% do not. And why is that? Because they all have the same chromosomal karyotype. The presentation of Alzheimer's in people with Down syndrome shares many of the same characteristics as those with early onset Alzheimer's with a few distinguishing characteristics. One is oftentimes in people with Down syndrome, the first presenting signs are changes in behavior or changes in personality. So perhaps the person with Down syndrome all of a sudden um, gets upset when things don't happen in a certain order, or perhaps they're more anxious, or perhaps they're more afraid of things that they weren't afraid about before. There's a kind of a, a change in the routine or personality of who they are. Sometimes at an older age, that could be the early signs. Another early sign that seems to be um, somewhat specific to people with Down syndrome is early onset seizures. So seizures in an adult with Down syndrome sometimes are an ominous precursor that there might be dementia or Alzheimer's to come. But all the other same symptoms of memory loss and some of the loss of activities of daily functioning that we would see in the adult typical population with Alzheimer's do come um, afterwards in people with Down syndrome. Right. Uh, so how how is this possibly going to help? Like, where are the parallels in terms of the research? Like, why, why can Down syndrome actually help us unlock the mystery behind Alzheimer's disease? Well, there are lots of clinical trials that are going on right now, both in the typical population with Alzheimer's, but increasingly so in people with Down syndrome. So for example, our site at Massachusetts General Hospital is participating in a phase one study to test a vaccine that the vaccine is hoping to activate the body's immune system to be able to attack those plaques from clumping together and hopefully making those plaques start to disintegrate. By working with people with Down syndrome and their families, who might have an enriched uh, possibility of developing Alzheimer's disease and might have plaques uh, more so than people in the typical population, we're going to see what the effects are of such a vaccine on this population, which might have applicability to the general population. So at what point do people with Down syndromes acquire a plaque in their brain? It's a great question, and research is still trying to untangle that. Um, and obviously the only way to truly know about plaques, of course, is unfortunately to do an autopsy after someone has passed, but increasingly with PET imaging and also even with some retinal scans, we're being able to understand a little bit more about amyloid plaques. But some research is suggesting as early as adolescent years, those plaques could start to accumulate in people with Down syndrome. Now, I would also say, Deborah, that there have been some post-mortem autopsies done of adults with Down syndrome who have no clinical signs of dementia whatsoever. And on autopsy, their brains are full of beta amyloid plaques. So plaques alone are not the full answer to the mystery, but it's probably part of the mystery that's leading to Alzheimer's, at least in this population. Do, do people, and uh, I'm sorry for my ignorance about Down syndrome, but do, as as um, a person with Down syndrome matures, as they get older, does the neurodegeneration become worse? Yeah, so certainly the stages of Alzheimer's that you see in the typical population does progress in people with Down syndrome. And as the Alzheimer's progress, sometimes their abilities to handle activities of daily living go down, their abilities to manage their own speech starts to to go down, their abilities to swallow goes down. So yes, you do start to see that deterioration. So you're, that, that would indicate that um, actually different parts of the brain are being impacted with age. That is the hypothesis. But again, on autopsy, some people with Down syndrome have an amazing accumulation of beta amyloid plaques, but no symptomatology whatsoever, where other people might have a lot of symptoms but then on autopsy might not have as many plaques. So many people in the neuroscience community believe that plaques have to be part of the mystery, but there has to be more to it. And you know, there's tau and neurofibrillary tangles and other probably 
uh, elements that we haven't quite fully appreciated. So where's the research right now, um, Dr. Scott Coe? Like when we look at both Alzheimer's and Down syndrome and you talked a little bit about kind of the interrelationship, but where's the research today and what more do we need to know? Well, I think it's never been a ex more exciting time to have Down syndrome than today because the world is investing in good quality research. And it's been so nice to see the National Institutes of Health really have funding set aside for clinical trials for and with people with Down syndrome. So I've really seen an acceleration of research over the past five years. And this includes basic science research. So we have a lot of mouse models with Down syndrome and a lot of great basic science research is going on. And we're now seeing that translational research happen where we have opportunities for clinical trials for people with Down syndrome to participate. And I have to say, families and people with Down syndrome are very eager, I have learned, to participate in trials that will be able to potentially prevent Alzheimer's from occurring in their loved ones and be able to contribute back to science. And you have a personal story with Down syndrome, don't you? Tell us a little bit about the personal connection. I have two great sisters. Kristen, uh, who is two years younger than I am, does have Down syndrome, and she's been a life coach for everything that I do. And it's because of her that I wanted to become a physician in the first place. But it's also because of her, I continue to have that passion and that motivation. Kristen is healthy and she is well, but I also know she's worked so hard for all of her accomplishments and I don't want her to one day lose it to Alzheimer's. And I know so many people out there who have loved ones feel the same and we all want to be able to fight the impact of Alzheimer's together. That's, that's amazing. And what a great, great way to dedicate your life when you have a family connection. Uh, what, what is usually typically the onset of Alzheimer's symptoms in somebody who has Down syndrome? Usually the first presenting sign might be changes in behavior. So caregivers know their loved one with Down syndrome so well. And when they say, gee, this small change in routine is really causing anxiety and really upsetting the person with Down syndrome. Sometimes that could be an early indication that they're starting to have more behavioral outbursts or behavioral dysregulations that might not seem right if the world is becoming a little bit more confusing. And then like I had previously mentioned, sometimes um, seizures, if they start to present after the age of 35, can be that kind of ominous kind of warning sign. But I also must say that there are so many other medical conditions that could occur in people with Down syndrome that might masquerade as Alzheimer's, and it's important to rule those out. So it's not uncommon for us in clinic to see an adult with Down syndrome who's having some brain fogging or some memory loss, and we realize it's due to obstructive sleep apnea and severe obstructive sleep apnea. And we know how to treat that. You know, we could treat it with CPAP or we could treat it with some of the surgical techniques. And once you get good oxygenated sleep and you treat sleep apnea, that brain fog and that memory loss is gone. So as important as it is to make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, it's equally important to make sure we've ruled out some of the other conditions that can masquerade as memory loss. So how is research, I mean, are Alzheimer's researchers now working with Down syndrome? Do you work with any Alzheimer's researchers? Are we, I mean, it sounds like the research really in connecting these two dots is, is pretty nascent. It truly is. You know, I'm trained in pediatrics and trained in medical genetics, and now I'm working with adult neurologists. And so my learning curve has been steep, but I take it with my patients and with my neurologists. And this is what I really love about where we are in medicine. There, there is a nexus of different fields coming together to solve a greater good. And you have pediatric medical geneticists working on grants with adult um, neurologists to be able to have a common goal. And uh, I think it's only when we combine all of our talents and working with our patients that we're gonna be able to totally unlock this mystery. Uh, Brian Scott, -Co, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your work, your research. Um, we want, when you, when you get that first light bulb about the connection and locking the mystery behind Alzheimer's, please come back and, and enlighten us. But thanks so much for joining us. Deborah, thank you for having me. So if you uh, want to learn more about this talk, if you missed any of it, um, please go to beingpatient.com. Sign up for our newsletter. We always are going to post upcoming talks uh, that you can join us, uh, join with us. And um, yeah, thanks for watching.